good evening participants welcome back to lecture number 10 of this 15 day lecture series on history of english literature uh today we are very happy and we are honored to have a uh, academician of great caliber repute and experience uh dr cg shamla ma'am and it is uh, a great honor and privilege to take the opportunity on behalf of team dad voyage to introduce a small introduction about her to you all she is basically uh, serving as an assistant professor presently in the post graduate department of english and research center for comparative study in mercy college uh, which is in palakkad kerala she has published several papers on diverse areas in select national and international journals and served as a resource person in various national and international webinars seminars and conferences her areas of academic interest include literary theory and criticism british literature gender studies and cultural studies she is a member of the editorial board of select national and international journal and is also a counselor at the ignu center at at thirisur uh, ignu center kerala and is also the resource person for the distance learning program of the university of calicut she is also the national coordinator of the two mooc mooc programs of ugc cc i am sure some of you all had registered recently in her concluded mooc program uh, we are very honored and happy to have ma'am along with us thank you so much we thank welcome you, you whole heartedly it's thank always you, an you. honor and pleasure uh, that you always entertain our uh invitation and you in spite of your busy schedule you take up the challenges that we always ask you because you know teaching the heterogeneous group is a very challenging task yes, yes. and thank you always for for supporting us because it is people like you all who add glory and honor to this platform and really it is because of people like you all experience and teaching methodology and pedagogy that our budding young academicians get highly benefited from uh, erudite lectures like you all without wasting much time ma'am the platform is all yours thank you once again thank you thank you sir uh dear friends today i thought i would talk about late modernism uh, i would be concentrating on several aspects related to not only the literature but also the background to which we study the period called late modernism but before i move into my slides on uh, late modernism i would like to inform you that this period is considered one of the most turbulent periods in the history of uh, english literature now the reason why this period is one of the most turbulent periods in the history of uh, english literature is that the, the the late modernism or the phase called late modernism is the phase that occupies several important uh, features of modernism and postmodernism of course late modernism you cannot say it's the early modern period you cannot say it's a post modern period now when you look at the history of english literature generally we say that the period after the second world war that's 1945 is supposed to be the post modern period because we notice several post modern ele elements creeping into uh, the uh, modern uh, period of course the aspects of modernism are also found in post modernism there are startling differences between the ways in which the works in the in the late postmodern era were written the topics that were discussed the genres of writing that developed and postmodernism had it had its effect not only in literature but also in art music architecture and in several other uh, areas of study so i'm not going to limit my presentation to literature alone but i'll tell you how this period called late modernism was not only a break from the early modern period but it also ushered a new way of looking into literature or the ways in which works were written the events that were responsible for the production of such works what sort of writers came to the forefront what is it that they actually wanted to project through their writings and how is it that this modern period is a period where there is a lot of conflict on the one hand and on the other hand there is this progressiveness or the movement towards attaining or achieving something 
Now, it is inevitable that the politics of every country uh, would interfere in the production of literature. However, the late modern period in the history of literature uh, was a period that witnessed not only the effects of politics, but also the ways in which the writers reacted to this particular situation because they were forced to adhere to the socio-economic and political changes that adversely affected all the uh, uh, fields or areas of study, economics, uh, politics, or whichever aspect you think. And the main reason for this is because the disillusionment after the uh, Second World War, or even after the First World War, to be more precise, and how is it that the superpower you had to, the access powers, so how is it that the decline of these powers or decline of the power structure contributed to uh, you know, a different perspective of life after the world war? Now, uh, I'm sure you all would have listened to the lecture on early modernism. So you find, or we would say that we just cannot encapsulate late modernism or early modernism or postmodernism into specific uh, periods by saying, it is from 1945 to this, you call it postmodern. Even after that, it's post postmodern, or even before that, it is the, uh, early modern. But you find here a gradual movement, a, a gradual moving towards something, a gradual moving on to recover something, a gradual movement to either uh, go against an idea. So, given all these, or having said all these, I thought I would just move on to my. Uh, presentation. And in order to do this, I thought I would begin with the quote given by Alan Weil. I found this book very interesting. Uh, he wrote Horizons of Essence, Modernism, Postmodernism, and the Ironic Imagination. And in this particular book, he talks about late modernism, which is a reaction against modernism by writers who retain uh, several of the modernist presumptions and strategies, but they differ from each other just as the early modernists did. And so what is this reaction to modernism? What are the features of modernism that these writers wanted to react? At the same time, what are those features of uh, modernism uh, that these, they wanted to retain? And how was it that they tended to differ from each other? So uh, having said this, we just move on to the next uh, slide. One minute. Yes. So uh, if you have to understand uh, how late modernism functions, you must know that it is a transitional phase. The say in the, in, the, in the sense that on the one hand, it had the features of the early modern period. Now, again, when I talk of the early modern period, I'm referring to the uh, last part of the, 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 the 18, uh, say 70s or 60s onwards, until the 1920s or so. And then from the 1920s or even 1930s onwards, we say the late modernism actually has evolved. So you find here, you have two world wars, the first world war uh, playing a very uh, important role in, uh, or playing a very important role as far as this transition is concerned. So naturally, when you have a war, uh, how do these writers, talk about fiction? How do these writers talk about the intersection of the politics of that age? And how is it that they predict the fiction of the period? So what happened here was, and I'm referring to this book by Tyrus Miller, who says that uh, late modernist writing is difficult to categorize as to what exactly did they want to talk about. And uh, they were actually caught between two eras. One is modernism and the other is postmodernism. Now, I shouldn't say that they were actually caught between. Uh, uh, I, I should say that uh, these texts actually had features of both uh, modernism and postmodernism. Uh, and I'm also uh, referring to these writers like uh, Juna Barnes, Wyndham Lewis, Samuel Beckett, and Mina Loy, where who are considered to be uh, postmodern. Most of the writings are postmodern but they show certain characteristics of the late modern period. So again, I would like to refer to uh, uh, Miller who says that late modernist writing 
is a literary type which is distinct in the sense that there is a certain skepticism that has creeped into their writing as to what exactly is modernist sensibility. Is it facing the world wars? Is it responding to the situation in a very uh, objective manner? Or is it recording the trauma, I shouldn't say trauma, recording the personal feelings that people have towards uh, the, uh, the, 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 the sufferings of the people? Or is it the destruction that they see around? So what are those things that these writers wanted to incorporate during the late modern period? So there were certain uh, disturbances, certain turbulences. And hence, there was a certain skepticism among writers as to what is it that they actually want to include in their writings. And hence, you could say that it is multifaceted, uh, but there is a coherent response to the earlier modernism in the sense that even though the late modern writers uh, were different in the way in which they projected their uh, writing, the the perspectives that they wanted to inform the people about, uh, you could say that they actually responded in certain aspects that were the same, but several others, they were markedly different. Now, but you cannot say that late modernism's reaction to the previous uh, writers, you could not say that they denied the concepts that were formulated by the early modern period, but it was a response to the pressures of the interwar years. Now, in yesterday's lecture, I'm sure you would have uh, you would have come across the uh, uh, the war poets as well as the writers uh, like Thomas Hardy who talk about the pessimism uh, of the day. Uh, or who? How do you think you have such pessimist characters coming up in several of their their works? So that was the phase in the early modern or the Victorian. You know, there was that movement from one phase to another phase. But when you come to a period called late modernism, it was a period that witnessed the writer's skepticism towards certain things that were being discussed or considered the standard or even considered canonical. And they wanted to do something different from what the early modern period had actually done. So uh, I would also like to uh, say that late modernism was more of a reaction to the historical processes and events that took place, and definitely the world war is one amongst them. Now in this book, A Shrinking Islands, Modernism and Natural Culture of England, you find uh, people talking about, or critics talking about uh, late modernism uh, that took, or adopted a particular style that was appropriate to depict Britain's loss of imperial power. So how was it that Britain was trying to become, uh, Britain was an imperial power for, for several uh, years, for several centuries, but how was it that this late modernism saw, the, saw Britain losing its imperial power? And so once you find a particular, imperial power losing its importance, how is it that the culture of that country would look into reinvesting uh, itself in uh, English natural culture? So the writers were giving a lot of importance to reviving certain aspects of English literature, not giving a lot of importance to the political situation in which uh, Britain was. Now, this is not to say that the writers were insensitive to Britain's uh, uh, cultural, uh, uh, what do I say, uh, richness, cultural diversity, or even its political power, but that they felt it's high time that we concentrate more on the ways in which we need to depict art and use art for something. Here, it's not using art for a specific purpose. It's not just art for art's sake, but they wanted to probe or go deeper into several aspects of British national culture. That's why we actually uh, talk about the high modernism or uh, we have the high modernists like T.S. Eliot, Virginia Woolf and uh, E.M. Forster. Uh, one must uh, know that uh, high modernism uh, gives a lot of importance to uh, what was the anthropological turn or, or let us try to understand what exactly I mean by this. 
or what exactly is the uh, what exactly is this uh, term but before i move into uh, talk telling you about high modernism i thought i would just tell you uh, some related aspects of, of uh, high modernism so you might ask me if there is something called low modernism of course there is nothing called low modernism but we generally talk of high modernism that appears as a sub genre of literary modernism and it talks about the works that were published uh, between the end of the first world war and the beginning of the second again i must tell you there is no uh, clear cut division by saying uh, this is high modernism or this is uh, early modernism this is late modernism but generally those works that were published between the end of the first world war and the beginning of the second is called this period of high modernism and heisen calls this the great divide because he says there is a clear distinction between art and mass culture now this is something that was opposed to by the by, by post modern literature and i'm sure in the coming sessions you would know more about post modernism and how is it that post modernism rejected several aspects of late modernism it did retain some aspects but it did reject several so in relation to uh, popular or mass culture it gave a lot of importance to art so it was firmly on the side of art now what sort of art high art this is exactly what post modernism refutes by saying there is no distinction between high culture and low culture and you will get to know more about this when we talk about post modernism right so as i told you uh, this movement called late modernism did not concentrate on literature alone but there was also uh, uh, inputs from different or other branches of uh, studies uh, so we have the architectural critic called charles jenks he used the word late modernism in a very systematic manner to talk about architectural scholarship and uh, he also talked about art criticism in relation to music also several aspects that uh, are are related to music even so you have uh, some aspects of uh, modernism in late modernism and it also goes beyond something known as high modernism so modernist artists are self consciously modernist uh, and uh, uh, you know or at which modernist aesthetics becomes uh, less effective you know or probably more difficult to continue this is the paradox or this is a contradiction that we find here so on one hand where modernist aesthetics is seen uh, to become less effective uh, they find that it's all the more difficult to continue and uh, some of the canonical people i could say writers or some of the writers were included under the post uh, sorry the uh, the period uh, you know where you have high modernism are uh, james joyce t s eliot uh, ezra pound uh, virginia wolf em forster proust catherine mansfield dorothy richardson uh, ernest hemingway and gertrude stein now i don't have uh, i i i don't think i need to elaborate on each of these writers but all these writers were experimental in their own ways they all delved with certain aspects of british culture certain aspects of uh, the, the 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 people's relation to their culture and certain aspects of writing that were particular to them alone so uh, i thought i would just talk about uh, this the late modernism where we find uh, several movements you know and all these movements uh you find them a part of modernism but they seem to reject some aspects of modernism and they develop themselves to be uh, conscious of the modernist enterprise yet differing from them so uh, the specific traits of modernism you have uh, form of purity the medium specificity art for art sake the authenticity of art and even the possibility of universal art universal truth in art and the importance being given to avogad and originality these were some of the specific traits of modernism now we find late modernism retaining some of these aspects or even though they retained some of these aspects they also tend to be different or they also tend to project another side or another face of it so we have several movements like futurism uh, cubism you have dadaism you have surrealism 
and uh, all these movements were part of the evo guard wherein there was this uh, experimentalist form of writing so techniques such as collage bringing in different forms art forms together you have cinema creating artworks that were very different especially the dadaist movement they rejected logic reason and uh, they gave a lot of importance to nonsense irrationality anti bourgeois protest in their works and now as you know the period after the first world war and even uh, just before the second world war even including the second world war was a time when there was this uh, anti establishment uh, protest in the sense people were generally dissatisfied with the government in britain so how is it that they expressed this dissatisfaction in their works and instead of uh, expressing their dissatisfaction in a straight manner or uh, showing that they, they decided to include several forms of writing that would express uh, you know uh, their dissatisfaction or you could say their anxiety or even their angst or you could say even their uh, anger you know in works that sounded nonsense but they actually made sense they sounded irrational but they were actually pointing to some uh, deficiency as far as the political system was concerned or they were against the bourgeois attitudes and they also have surrealism now surrealism which developed in europe uh, after the first world war was influenced by the dada movement and so you have uh, the depiction of the unconscious mind through images now this is where you have surrealism that developed out of dadaism is considered very different because for the first time there was this probing into the human mind now i'm sure in the previous lecture on the early modernism you would have uh, encountered freud the 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 how freud studied the conscious mind the unconscious mind he talks about the uh, uh, what do i say the id the ego and the super ego he also talks about how you find uh, working through the human mind could be analyzed by studying dreams that's why his, his most famous dream work the four stages of dreams so all this was outlined by freud and that, that's when you have surrealism taking insights from not only freud but you have something related to psychology or psychoanalysis and hence how do you think the unconscious mind of people could be activated through imagery is what they uh, concentrated on and you have futurism that originated in italy Uh, here for the first time they talk about as i told you uh, this period uh, was the period uh, where you had the world war and so it was the first time that you have the use of weapons weaponry technological advancements were being made and how was it that speed was considered very important light and speed so how was it that the concept of light and speed could be used uh, into literature or could be used to depict art so this is very important for this this period and that's why you have in 1945 when you had the second world war the atom bomb was dropped you know you find these objects of violence or how do you think that technology could be harnessed in different ways and how is it that speed or even scientific development could be used in different ways is what futurism wanted to project but unfortunately uh, industrialization led to the second world war so there was this dissatisfaction among people in general as to uh, in spite of uh, talking about how the war could affect the multitude psychologically you know how is it that <clears throat> technology actually affected their lives in a very negative manner so <clears throat> now i thought i would just talk about something related to postmodernism to tell you how there was this 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 uh, uh, divide between modernism and postmodernism you know was very important so that you have a gradual movement from late modernism to post modernism now uh, while the post modernism gave a lot of importance to grand narratives of artistic direction post modernism rejected it so post modernism did not want to distinguish between high and low forms of art and it did not want to disrupt genre Uh, and its conventions of collision collage and uh, and fragmentation so it wanted to disrupt genre sorry it actually disrupted genre uh, it did not want as much the modern period or the early modernism or even the late modernism gave a lot of importance to can canon the formation of the canon uh, you know this stuck to uh, genre 
they wouldn't allow the sliding between genres. And uh, how was it that the uh, postmodern period, though it incorporated several aspects of the modern period or even the late modern period, uh, talked about collage or even fragmentation. Collage is when you bring uh, different ideas or when you bring different modes of presentation together to form an entirely different way of writing. And even the fragmentation. Fragmentation is how is that you, you, you find the fragment itself or the divided self being included. Now, I don't want to go to greater aspects of postmodernism because I'm sure the coming lecture will talk about this. My intention is to tell you how postmodern art uh, talks about things which are unstable and insincere. And hence, they use irony, parody, humor to talk about uh, political situations or positions which cannot be uh, overturned by critique or even later events. So postmodern art, on the one hand, uh, says that things are unstable. Several things are insincere. So in order to project things which are unstable, unfixed, slide with slide, there's nothing definite, there is nothing fixed there. How do I project it by using literature? And that's why they made use of irony, parody, and humor. So, and uh, uh, what is most important as far as postmodern art is that they differed from what modernism wanted to project. Now, uh, in, the, in the sense that uh, postmodernism and modernism are movements in art. And uh, the most important aspect of uh, the difference is that while modernism is progressive, in the sense it's more advanced, it tries to look forward to something. Postmodern rejects that notion. So on one hand, you could say that the uh, early modern or even the late modern period was a period where there was, there was people were more positive in the sense they thought something better could happen. But postmodernism rejects any notion of advancement of progress in art. That's very important. So, <clears throat> and thus one of the projects of art must be the overturning of the myth of the Evo God. So they, they believe that uh, there is nothing called an Evo God, similarly, uh, uh, what was negation of what the old structuralists talked about meta narratives. Now, I'm not, uh, what exactly is Evo God? Evo God is nothing but experimental writing, as I said earlier. So, mainstream culture and conventions are rejected. We found the Dadaism, surrealism, futurism, we also have Vorticism which is another movement that is related to Evo God. And it especially talks about how uh, the, the, the human mind of, of how, uh, on one hand, or if you could say the depiction of the state of uh, the culture of Britain or even the world as such after first of all could be represented. So uh, Evo God is actually a term that is used by the French military, you know, uh, refer to a small group that scouted ahead of the main force. So at at uh, some point, the middle of the century, you know, the 19th century, this term was linked to how um, art could, through idea, you know, art as an instrument for social change. How do we incorporate certain elements of this into art and how so that it could be used as an in instrument for social change? Now, I would also like to uh, refer to this book, Modernism and World War II. Uh, it is actually a story or that tells you that England was trying to remake itself immediately after the Second World War. So when we talk about uh, writers of high modernist writers like T.S. Eliot, we should also not forget about less important writers like uh, Henry Green and Evelyn Waugh. Uh, some of uh, these two are the most influential writers, I should say, who, uh, uh, who, who uh, need recognition as far as the late modern period is concerned. Now, Mackey uh, talks about national consciousness. As I told you, Britain had lost its imperial position. And how do you think that national consciousness could be very important as far as a late modernism is concerned? And what sort of changes did uh, war bring to the relationship between the state and public life? Now, modernist uh, uh, writers concentrate on two issues. One is the transformation and the persistence of modernism. So what should be transformed? So, and the persistence of modernism. So what sort of modernism should we follow? That was on one hand. 
the other is the function of modernist aesthetics in different historical situations. So how do you think that aesthetics of the period would contribute to the different historical situations? These were the two main issues that were addressed by the uh, late modern writers. So we have uh, Virginia Woolf, you have T.S. Eliot, you have Joseph Conrad, D.H. Lawrence, James Joyce as these uh, modern uh, writers. And uh, it, it was important for them uh, to uh, talk about a world that was reeling under economic hardship, fascist dictatorship, and probably moving towards another war. Uh, as I told you, one mustn't forget that this late modern period is a period of great conflict, because on the one hand, where there, there were progressive ideas, on the other hand, you find this progression leading to another war. So it was very difficult for them to write about one particular concern alone. While Eliot lamented fragmentation, disunity, or on the one hand, Virginia Woolf talks about the androgynous uh, mind. Virginia Woolf talks about the stream of consciousness technique which probes into the human mind. You have Joseph Conrad uh, you know, talking about uh, imperialism. You have D.H. Lawrence uh, bringing several aspects of gender and sexuality. We also have uh, James Joyce also talking about uh, this, uh, the stream of consciousness, and the importance of stream of consciousness. You have the different ways in which they project this particular situation, not only reflects the ways in which war has affected the tendencies of people, but the writers were themselves different in their ways in which they would analyze this post uh, late uh, modern period. So uh, what exactly did they do? What exactly did they want to do? So Wolf, Joyce, and even Conrad, they uh, employed free indirect discourse and they uh, actually used a strategy called the interior monologue or even the stream of consciousness to explain how uh, people would uh, register the experience at the two levels, both conscious as well as the unconscious level, the probing, the workings of the human mind. So uh, these, the novels were uh, more, uh, they were called introverted novels, you know, because uh, they didn't talk about uh, the events that actually happened outside, but the events that were taking place in mind of the individual. Now, this is not to say that the writers did not give importance to what was happening outside, or that they did not give importance to the historic events that actually happened, but they also were interested in how the human mind responded to the events that happened outside. So on the one hand, you could find writers talking about war, the horror of war, the socio-political economic situation, the dampening of uh, the, uh, what was the British culture, social systems. That was on one side. On the other hand, how is it that the human mind would respond to uh, such events? What happens to the sensibilities of an individual who has to face war? Or how is it that the confusion or the turmoil in the mind of the protagonist, the turmoil in the mind of the individuals, how is it that that would respond to the changes that are happening outside? So this conflict between the events happening outside with, is radically related to the conflict in the mind of the individual. That's why these are the introverted novels. They gave a lot of importance to subjective experience, you know, than the events that occasioned there. So what led to this experience is not very important. What is important is how does the human mind respond to that particular event? This is what the introverted novels gave a lot of importance to. And of course, the writings of Wolf, Joyce and Conrad are about such uh, probings into the uh, psyche or unconscious state, or uh, you can say the conscious mind of the individual. So uh, now on the one hand, by late modernism was rooted firmly in the social and political sphere because of the world war. On the other hand, it was also a definite probing into the human sensibilities and, and the ways in which uh, the human mind responded to uh, the events outside. Here, importance is not given to the events that happen, that are happening outside, but how is it that the human mind res is responding to the events that are happening outside? So a highly subjective mode of experience is being narrated. 
Now you have several uh, poets like Charles Madge, William Emerson, Kathleen Rain. I have taken some of these writers also coincide with American literature. Uh, you find uh, Humphrey Jennings, Stuart Legg, David Casbon, Sheila Legg, all of them talking of strange half poetic, half sociological experiences in pre-war years. So I'm talking of this period in 1937. So naturally these poets uh, will definitely talk about uh, those feelings that were happening and they found poetry to be um, an expression of this dissatisfaction or this distaste for the events that are happening outside. Now, apart from that, in the 1940s, you have T.S. Eliot's Four Quartets, you have Virginia Woolf, Between the Acts, Henry Green's Fiction, Dylan Thomas, Blitz Elegies, H Hilda Doolittle, that's HD, Trilogy, the fiction of Elizabeth Bowen, you know, how is it that all of them talk about, uh, you know, uh, the experience of living in a bombed city or in a when you live in a bombed city, what, what actually happens to uh, uh, individuals or how do individuals respond or react to this? And how is it that the ruined cityscapes of London provide uh, the room or give the space for talking about the uh, ravages of war? Now, uh, you also have another, the, the bewildering experience actually of living, you know, in a city under attack, you have uh, ways in which they respond to it. So uh, what happens when you are in, in, a, in a place that's torn by war, you have blackouts, travel restrictions, so food rationing and participation of civilians in war, and how does these affect the daily life? So all this uh, talks about, you know, the modern restriction actually, uh, even in the late modernism talks about these circumstances you know how is it that their privileges have been diminished and it is a period of compulsory uh, what do i say staticity so when you are in stasis when there's inertia when there is complete blockage or stoppage of everything life comes to a standstill so what happens when life comes to a standstill until then when you have uh, Britain, that was the most, uh, uh, what do I say, advanced country, then suddenly finding itself, uh, you know, facing all these situations, men going for war, women at home. So what happens when everything is disturbed? And this is what they wanted to uh, a project. And that's why in the 1950s, again, you have the angry young men group of writers, you know, uh, talking about, uh, uh, you also have the kitchen sink drama, uh, we, we also have the, uh, you know, uh, movements that talk about uh, the, the, the frustration of the middle class educated, uh, what do I say, uh, men. Uh, how is it they weren't able to find a job for them? Kings Leanus, you know, how is it they, were, they weren't able to find a job for themselves? So uh, they were anti-establishment against the political regime in, in, in Britain. And here, one of the most interesting aspects is the rise of Caribbean writers. So people from the Caribbean islands, like George Lamming, Samuel Selwyn, Nye Paul, and Derek Walcott, you know, all of them are talking about modernist and metropolitan literature, nationalism, and post-coloniality. So here, for the first time, we have something called metropolitan literature. For the first time, we are going to think about something called post-colonialism. We're going to think. We are going to think about uh, nationalism. We're going to think about the human body. How is that it's going to talk about uh, na nationalism or the, the thing called uh, national consciousness is concerned. Now, uh, during this period, uh, the war period, especially uh, even after the war during the 1950s, you find people migrating from one place to the other. So what are the problems confronted by uh, migrancy? And hence, you could see the struggles encountered by immigrants or even immigrants, especially in England. So this was also being given a lot of importance to by the writers of the Caribbean islands. Now I make special reference to Caribbean writers here is because uh, in this period called 1940s, we don't give a lot of importance. Now we gave a lot of importance to angry young men group or even kitchen sink drama or several other types of puppet saucer drama. There are several types of not only drama, but also fiction that emerged during this time. They talked about divided consciousness. They also talked about identity, loss of identity. But something that was very prominent during this time is the migrancy or the emigration. So what are the struggles of you know, migrant life? 
Now, uh, apart from that, we also have uh, importance being given to travel writing. So this is the time when you have people traveling, uh, crossing boundaries uh, uh, illegally or illegally. Uh, people, as I said, migrating from one country to the another for, for several other causes. So travel writing was given a lot of importance. So late modernism paved the way for studies related to travel writing. Now, when I say travel writing, it encompasses all the aspects of migration, let it be forced migration or even unforced migration, or migration in search of prospects to, to several countries, or a migration because of war. So travel writing, in, uh, travel by sea, travel by air, travel by road, so all forms of travel writing were experimented on in this uh, late modern period. And I believe this tribal writing during this late modern period could be one of the best topics as far as research is concerned, because you have uh, several writers writing about different facets of uh, tribal writing, taking into consideration uh, politics, economy, or even the social life. So you have different uh, forms of and definitions as well as functions of art. art as a response to uh, that particular moment, the changes that were happening at that particular moment. Uh, how is it that forms of expression also changed during this period? And how is it that definitions of art or even literature, as, as and also the function of art and literature gained different dimensional appeal? That's all I think I have for uh, late uh, modernism today. And, but before I uh, wind up my lecture, I would like everybody to go through these, uh, uh, these uh, books that I would uh, like you to, uh, know. is your journey really necessary? You're going nowhere in late modern, this is the book, or this, this is the article that I was referring to by Marina McKay, that talks about travel writing and people finding themselves nowhere. Uh, and her book, Modernism and uh, the Second World War is also very important as far as uh, talking about uh, the, the um, I should say, the ambiguous position of the individual who has just come out of the early modern period, just out of war, but going towards nowhere. They don't know where they're actually moving to. Uh, but there is there are signs of progress, but is it progress or is it to another war? So this particular period, that was very, very important. And uh, yes, this one... Uh, book by Brian McHale talks about postmodernist fiction. Uh, this, this book actually tells you about the differences between uh, late modernism and postmodernism. So when you, on, on the one hand, where you had the modern fiction uh, giving a lot of importance to the uh, unconscious and the subconscious levels of, of uh, human thinking, on the one hand, you have the postmodernist fiction celebrating fragmentation, divided uh, self. So that clash between the Modern concept and the postmodern concept is excellently described by Brian McKay. Similarly, we have this Tyrus Miller who talks about complementarity. Uh, you know, how what sort of films actually came up during this time? Uh, what sort of ideas converged to, uh, to talk, talk about modernism and modernity? There's a lot of difference between ism and, and it. So when you talk of modernism as a movement and modernity as a phase, so that particular phase is what Tyrus Miller talks about. And uh, Tyrus Miller also in his book, Late Modernism, gives you a brief description of the politics, fiction, and arts between the world wars. Here, uh, it, it deals with the ways in which uh, writers were on the one hand, faced with the uh, dilemma of projecting the uh, divided self. At the same time, they saw themselves uh, uh, totally helpless because this is exactly or uh, this was the condition in which the people lived. They were uh, they were dissatisfied with their own lives. So, in what way did the late modern period react to not only the human sensibilities but also the drastic political condition? On the one hand, seeking progression. On the other hand, this progress leading to another war. So, is this leading to a war? Or is it leading to progression? What was actually going to happen? The world itself was confused. So that dilemma is being brought about excellently by Tyrus Miller in this particular book. Uh, and also this, uh, this one by uh, Majori Perloff, who talks of 20th century uh, modernism. Again, this 
uh, look at the title here. We call it 21st century modernism. So on one hand, where uh, Majorie talks of the 21st century, she's also referring to the late modern elements that you find in 21st century writing. So uh, this, uh, these are some of the excellent books that you could refer to and read through to give you a good idea of the late, um, what do I say, modern period. Okay, thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for uh, discussing the ideas of this particular age and uh, how correlating uh, it is. Sir, I, I, can you just give me a break for one minute? Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I will just come back as soon as okay, possible uh, okay, for just one minute. I'll okay. just come back now. First question uh, one of the participants asked is, what are the peculiarities and drawbacks of this age? Okay. That's a very, very interesting question. In fact, I was, I really wanted to, uh, yeah. So one of the drawbacks of this age is that uh, the writers themselves weren't conscious about a definite literary movement. So if you ask me, uh, what exactly is a literary movement? A literary movement is one that would talk about the definitiveness of the intention of the authors in that period. But in this late modern period, they did not have something called a literary movement as such. But you find that uh, uh, the, the, this particularly movement, literary movement for that matter, uh, interlinking with other branches of studies like psychology, narratology, you know, uh, as I said, Dadaism, collage. So uh, this movement was uh, not focused only on one literary movement. Rather, it was trying to find ways in which it could incorporate several other areas or, or you know, interdisciplinarity. Now, if you ask me if that is actually a drawback, I wouldn't say it's a drawback because uh, literature is something that has to reflect in the art. But definitely in this period, we cannot say there was something called a, uh, you know, uh, a drawback as such, but I find a lot of experimentation was being done. But where was this experimentation leading people to? What is this experimentation art actually trying to tell the people? The human mind. How was the human mind was tossing between the events that were happening outside, the conflict inside? So I wouldn't say this movement is there's actually a drawback in this movement, but rather uh, I would say writers were more into experimenting with forms, going behind genres. Areas that had never been explored were being explored for the first time. This is what I would like to say. Thank you, ma'am. The next question is, could you please re-emphasize on the changing meanings of, of avant-garde or avant-garde? Yeah, yeah. Avogad, uh, as you actually say, was actually a French term that, uh, that meant, you know, uh, when you look at the army, you have certain people leading from the front. So those troops which led from the front were known as the advanced guard. It's called advanced guard if you translate it into English. And uh, this particular uh, movement uh, related to advanced guard were, now if you, tra if you translate Evo guard to English, it means advanced guard. Uh, so you have movements like Dadaism, uh, Surrealism, uh, movements like Futurism, Vorticism. And these movements were actually trying to inform people that something drastic is going to happen. Something is not right with the political system. Some world, or they must find new ways or modes of expressing their dissatisfaction or discontentment with life. And this is actually this this particular thought was not reflected in literature, but it was more related to art. That's why we have collage, fragmentation you know, uh, depiction, things upside down, painting, especially painting, architecture, you have these revolutionary methods of probing into the dissatisfaction in human life. And this paved the way for postmodernism in uh, literature. That's why in postmodern literature, when the next session is on postmodernism, you find how the advanced thinking, or, or you can say the, the, they talked about this dissatisfaction through images, through pictures, through art, to architecture, not exactly through writing. In writing, we only have the stream of consciousness technique to be uh, very important. Uh, or, or, um, but when you talk about art, you have all these features. And these are very important as far as literature is concerned because 
to a certain extent some of these uh, aspects of these types of advanced god forms were found in literature and this paved the way for postmodernism that's why late modernism and postmodernism if you ask me where is the barrier between both there is a lot of difference between both at the same time you find postmodernism very different from late modernism this is uh, 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 this is this is something which will definitely be explored in the other sessions uh, because postmodernism is a very fascinating age that uh, has several features of late modernism and how is it that it it just moves away from several aspects of modernism thank you ma'am that's all uh next question is hokima adorno and fuko they see progress as a kind of trap yeah. what the let what did the late modernists say about it okay now when you talk about uh, fuko on the one hand hokheimer on the other uh, i i believe uh, when we talk of uh, fuko we mainly talk about this discipline and punish uh you know the concept of the panopticon being very open uh but i don't think the late modernists had to contribute more about or uh, they did say more, uh, more about this conflict or that uh what do i say uh, hawkheimer or even uh, fuko had to say now when fuko talks about uh, discipline and punish or he talks of power i think he says power is everywhere so uh, here we find this particular ideology uh, not finding uh, much of a thrust as far as uh, late modernism is concerned or even uh, i wouldn't say even hawkheimer actually talked uh, you know gave a lot of importance to or you know find these aspects of these two theorists or even the the the, the perspectives that they took into late uh, modernism of course uh, uh, fuko's most important statement as power is everywhere uh, is one thing that Uh, did influence writers but i'm not sure whether the uh, late modernists actually responded to what fuko had to say thank you ma'am with that we come to the end of a very engaging and interesting session and uh, hopefully uh, the participants have uh, duly benefited from the inputs that ma'am has shared today about this important age because uh, this age after this age follows some of the very important trends and uh, i'm sure the questions that were asked has been very fruitfully answered and very clearly answered uh, so ma'am with uh, sir, that i would uh, like to mention one more thing i would like yes, to just mention uh, uh, just a few points more uh, now uh, as, as there were some questions interesting questions coming up there so i thought i would just share one or two points more regarding the questions that are uh, there one is uh, as i told you the late modern period it this is not the end of experimental so from this they move on to the, the postmodern has not yet arrived there's still one more leg to go before postmodernism actually enters so that's why we have this this movement that that you notice here uh, please students should remember that you cannot exactly demarcate any period in history of english literature to say this period to this is this period is from this period to this is this period no you find each period overlapping the tendencies of one period are also found in the other period this is what i want to emphasize so if we talk of horkheimer if you talk about uh, michel foucault or if you talk about freud you talk about lacan who 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 was very important we find that all these theorists have in one way or the other influence the literature of that period but even though we are not talking of literary criticism here we are talking of how did the literary world respond to what was happening so if you ask me about this period called the late modern period or late modernism it's not more about critical thinking but it's more about a response of the people to that particular situation that's why i mentioned the uh, angry young men group they talk of the kitchen sink drama different types of uh, observations made by dramatists of people this was a period where they actually wanted to uh, express the dissatisfaction the disillusionment uh, in people regarding the progression that was being made by such an imperialist country as britain and that effect is found in literature in the entire world not only in british literature and don't forget it was in this period that we have america emerging as a superpower that's most important and britain's power slowly declining so it is into this decline that Uh, uh, you know, one must concentrate on. 
thank you ma'am with that we come to the end of today's session and uh, words are not enough to thank uh, our resource person of the day uh, thank you ma'am for uh, sparing the time and delivering such an important lecture and hope uh, hope uh, thank to you, see sir, you for again this opportunity i should say uh, this, this 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 group of lectures being conducted by you is a blessing for all the students i do hope all the students make use of this platform to their maximum potential you know and uh, try to find ways of understanding literature and in this world of the, in this pandemic time if such sessions are being conducted i'm sure uh, the, the the organizer hats off to the organizer for taking so much pains in doing it thank you so thank much you sir much. a great effort on your side for the literary world thank you ma'am please take care and thank you very much thank for you. accepting our invitation always and coming on the platform and sparing your time it's my it pleasure, is always sir, a sir. blessing and always an honor to have you on this platform and thank you so much sir for the opportunity thank you so much ma'am please take care yes. good night good night participants good night good night